Last year, Professor Fitting uh, retired, now he's a professor emeritus. He still uh, does research at the Graduate Center, and uh, he is going to talk today on something that he wrote uh, very recently. Uh, professor Fitting received his doctorate from Yeshiva University in Mathematics, and his legal advisor was logician Raymond Spanian whom we had the great pleasure to have in this faculty together with Professor Fittig some six, seven years ago when they gave a talk for the faculty and students here. In June 2012, Professor Fitting was given the Hellbrand Award by the Conference on Automated Deduction for distinguished contributions to automated deduction. On that occasion, Professor Fitting told me uh, it was for the first time that he gave a speech in mm -hmm. set, a short, very penetrating and illuminating speech on his ideas about logic that you can see on his web page. Uh, I took from that uh, speech a few lines. The motivation for much of Melvin Fitting's work can be formulated as follows. There are many logics. Our principles of reasoning vary with context and subject matter, multiplicity is one of the glories of modern formal logic. The common thread tying logics together is a concern for what can be said, syntax, what that means, semantics, and relationships between the two. The philosophical position that can be embedded in a formal logic has been thereby shown to be coherent, but alas, not correct. Logic is a tool, not a master, but it is an enjoyable tool to use. Let me just add that uh, he published uh, some dozens of articles and many books from which I mentioned here Intuitionistic Logic, 1969, which was his PhD thesis, A Kripke Cleaning Semantics for Logic Programs, First Order Logic and Automated Theory Improving, Set Theory and the Continuum Problem, uh, which he co-authored with Raymond Smagen, First Order Model Logic, co-authored with Richard Mendelssohn, Types, Tableau, and Builder's Guide, Incompleteness in the Lab of Sense. Today, Professor Pitting will talk about height and happiness. Okay, thank, you. Now, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. There's an old uh, joke that probably goes back to David Hilbert's time uh, that in uh, work on the foundations of mathematics, a formalist is a mathematician who can't understand anything unless it has no meaning. Uh, well, what I want to do today is uh, uh, show you a formalization of certain natural language things, very simple ones. Uh, when you see the formalization, uh, you, you would naturally say, well, goodness, I didn't say that. But uh, this is trying to, to capture the, the full semantics of it and make the distinctions that we mentally make ordinarily without actually being aware of it much of the time. And we try and spell it out. It looks a bit formidable. But I'll try, uh, if, it, if it gets too bad, uh, I'll just stop. So, okay. Uh, 
difference between these. The, the King of Sweden is a definite description. Picks out different people at different times. Uh, Alice is a proper name. Proper names are generally taken to be rigid, so it's the same Alice no matter what time you're at. Uh, also, what about Alice might have been happier than he is. Um, okay. Now, what's a simple way of modeling this? And if proper, na proper names are rigid designators, how do they vary the way the King of Sweden does? Um, so definite descriptions as such, uh, if you know them from Bertrand Russell, uh, you need quantifiers and equality, but the basic ideas uh, there can be uh, uh, explained with much less machinery. Uh, the point about a definite description is that it picks out a different object under different circumstances, uh, and it explains how it's picking it out. You don't really need to know for these problems how it's picking the object out. You just know that it can pick out different objects under different circumstances, and so we can suppress some of the, the machinery. Uh, and as far as Alice goes, um, Alice is a rigid designator. It's, it's not a different person from time to time. So how do we handle that? Right, so what I want to do is give a formal language in which the machinery for this can be expressed. Uh, it'll be a language of modal logic because we're talking about under different circumstances. Um, the, the thing is, the language won't exactly be propositional. Uh, you need more than that. It won't exactly be first order either. We don't have quantifiers. I just said that's, that's more than we'll actually need. So it'll be something in between, and I'll say some more about that in a few minutes. But you'll see. OK. The syntax is not enough. Of course, you need a semantics to go with it. And so I'll show you the semantics. Um, I don't think there'll be time to discuss proof systems. Uh, this, is, this is actually from uh, a, a paper that hasn't been published yet. Uh, Professor Robert Barik is, uh, uh, is 75, and they're having a, a, a volume honoring him. And this is a paper for that volume. Uh, it hasn't been published yet, and I, I don't think he's seen it yet. So uh, don't tell him if you run into it. Uh, uh, but uh, if there is time, I'll say something about this. OK, so King of Sweden picks out different people at different times. But it's, it, it also is partial. There are times when there is no king. It doesn't pick out any time. A definite description says how this picking out is done. But that's more than we need. We just need that it, it does this. Um, so a modal language, I want to use relation symbols, which means, of course, we have to have uh, variables or terms or something like that for the relation symbol to apply to. Uh, but we won't need quantifiers. So uh, we're still speaking informally. I'll give you a formal syntax in a little while. But what t of x, y informally mean person x is taller than person y? So it's not true if x is not a person. Uh, it's not true if x and y are persons, but uh, x is shorter than y. Uh, I understand I'm, I'm blurring things together here. Informally mean, you'd have to say, what I'm doing here is explaining the interpretation of t. Uh, and person x and person y, well, there are variables, but we're working under an implicit valuation of values assigned to these variables. All of that's kind of suppressed here. Uh, box x, uh, well, for the time being, let's give it a, a temporal reading. Uh, let it informally mean x is true at all future times. Uh, if diamond is not box not, then this means x is true at some future time. Uh, and we don't need to go into much detail about what time is like, uh, uh, discrete, uh, continuous, or anything like that. It, it really plays no role there. Uh, so let m. And uh, think of M as a constant symbol. Uh, Non-rigidly designate the king of Sweden, or perhaps nobody at all. Uh, so at different times, M designates a different person, and there are times when M doesn't designate. Um, we want to say that at some future, M designates someone taller than the person M designates now. Uh, well, it's possible that well, t of m, m, that, that certainly can't be correct. 
Um, see, the, the, the problem is one of scope. In this possible T of M, M, the second M should be outside the diamond and the first uh, M inside. Uh, the, uh, the, the second one is outside uh, the diamond. You're talking about what M designates now. If the first M is inside the diamond, it's what M designates at some possible future. And there's no, uh, there's nothing in the machinery, the syntactic machinery, to make that distinct. It's one we do when, in, when we talk, but people understand what we're saying. Uh, so, predicate abstraction. Uh, what I want to do is introduce a scoping mechanism. Uh, so, what we're doing is taking, uh, uh, well, all right, here. Phi is a formula. Uh, C is a non rigid constant symbol. And we'll make this more general in a little while. Uh, X is a variable. And I want to think of this as being true in a possible world if the formula phi is true there when you assign to x as its value whatever it is that c designates there. Is that reasonably clear? I mean, c designates different things at different worlds. Give x the value that c designates there. Now, you notice there's, there's a type distinction here. Uh, c is non-rigid. What c designates at a particular world is no longer non-rigid. It's a particular object. So the x here is not really the same type of thing as the c. Uh, if c doesn't designate it a world, we have to decide what to do. And we'll just take the abstract to be false. Uh, you're saying uh, you can't assign uh, a, a property to a thing if you don't have the thing. There, there are various ways of handling that. But one, one plausible way uh, is uh, if C doesn't designate, the thing could have no truth value. But then you get into uh, a multiple value logic, and there are several of those, and there's no particular good reason for choosing one over another. So let's just say this is false if C doesn't designate. So here's a formulation of uh, someday the monarch will be taller than now uh, with this abstraction machinery. Uh, uh, notice this M it, uh, it goes with that Y, uh, and that puts it outside the modal operator. This M goes with the X, and that puts it inside the modal operator. So you, you've got the uh, you've got the scoping machinery here. Um, actually, if you look at uh, Russell's treatment of definite descriptions, uh, not the one in on denoting, but the one in the second edition of Brinkipia. Uh, he has this scoping mechanism there. The, the, the notation is different, it's more complicated, but it's explicitly there. And then as quickly as possible, he, he proves that, uh, oh, if something is rigid, the scope doesn't matter. Um, under certain circumstances, uh, you can take it to be wide scope. And so he starts leaving the, uh, the, the notation indicating scope out. But it's there, of course, because definite descriptions, when you translate them away, you introduce existential quantifiers, and they have scopes. But, so th this has been there all along. Uh, and it's really the scope machinery that's, that's the heart of the matter. Uh, now, so what this is saying is it's true of the present king, that's the value of y, which gets what it can, uh, uh, designates at the moment that at some possible future, that's the diamond, so I'm reading this from outside in, the taller than predicate will hold between the king then, that's the value of x, which uh, where x gets assigned what m designates when you move to a possible alternate world, uh, and the present king. So it's true of the present king that at some possible future, the taller than predicate will hold between the king then and the present king. Now, Again, this is still informal, but I will give you a formal syntax in a few minutes that actually gives it this reading. Uh, Alice. Okay. There are different kings of Sweden at different times. Uh, these are separate problems because so far none of the kings have been named Alice. Uh, but Alice is a proper name. And 
names are generally taken to be rigid designators, so you can't say the Alice at some other uh, in a, some other state compared to the Alice now. They're the same Alice. So what we are saying is something like Alice could be taller than herself. Um, well, so if we formalized it the same way we just did, it would turn into this. So it, it's simply I put A's where I had M's. But the, the trouble is, if A is rigid, this is true. Now, uh, I haven't told you how to interpret the equality symbol, but simply interpret it to be a, a quality between objects. At a um, so what's this saying? Uh, the value of Y, what Alice designates now, is necessarily, necessarily has this property, that it is equal to the value of A, that's, that's the X, at some other world, at all other worlds. So it's saying what A designates now is equal to what A designates at any accessible world. If A is rigid, that's, that's the case. Um, and once I give you the semantics, uh, it will be very easy to see that from these two, this is a logical consequence. And that's simply saying that Alice is possibly taller than herself. And you don't really want me to say it quite that way. Um, so we need something else here. This one is taller. So uh, a, a solution to this kind of problem, Alice is a rigid designator, same in all possible ways, but her intersection <coughs> properties can vary. Um, like height. Yes. Uh, presumably you're the same person now that you were when you were 10 years old, but your height is not the same. So suppose we have a function of the mapping a person to a height. And before the, the T predicate, we didn't really have to care what a height was, we just had to be able to compare them. Now let's say a height is a number. Uh, so even if A is rigid, what H assigns to A can vary from world to world because H doesn't have to be rigid. Okay, so the A is a rigid constant, but the H doesn't have to be a rigid function. It can assign different values to a constant at, at different, uh, under different circumstances. So the thing is, attributes can change while the individuals who have the attributes remain fixed. So this is a first draft of uh, modeling that. So take key to be a greater than predicate and think of heights as numbers. Um, evaluate, the y is you evaluate h of a now, then you move to an alternative world, you evaluate the h of a there, that's x, and uh, if this is correct, uh, uh, Alice's height at that alternate world should be in the greater than relation to Alice's height in the present world. It's more machinery, but uh, I don't know how else to handle it. But uh, so we need a proper formalization, and then this was an oversimplification. Uh, so we'll see what else we need. Uh, so proper formalization. Uh, assume we have objects, and well, it's a proper formalization. I'm still being informal. They're the things we actually bump into, people. Numbers, it's a kind of a soft one, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and intentions, non rigid designators, definite descriptions, my best friend, the world's tallest people. The idea is intentions pick out objects under different circumstances. So the language we're using, uh, this is a simplified version. Uh, one can have more complicated versions, and I'll say in what way a little later. Uh, but so we have object variables. These are used the way I did before. They take as values objects. Uh, intention constants. Uh, these are non rigid and pick out different objects under different circumstances. Intention function symbols. Um, relation symbols. Okay. Uh, it, it's often convenient to think of uh, intention constants as zero place intention function symbols. They just don't take arguments. So uh, that makes, means you don't have to give separate rules for the two of them. There's just one set of rules. So intention terms, uh, intention function symbol applied to a bunch of things, atomic formulas, relation symbol applied to a bunch of things. 
But you notice here there's no nesting. They're really applied to variables, and that's all. And variables will be given objects as values. So the intention term, uh, uh, intention function applied to objects. When I said this could be made more complicated, yes, you could have intention terms applied to intention terms. Uh, atomic formulas, uh, relation of objects, these are variables again. You could have a more complicated, you could have uh, a relation implied to objects and intentions. But this is all we need for what we're talking about now. So again, only variables here. Uh, why? Uh, because there, if you don't do something like this, ambiguities come up. There are some natural abbreviations, but those abbreviations only cover some cases. You'll see examples in a few minutes. So, definition of formula, much of it is uh, routine. Atomic formulas are formulas. Formulas are closed under logical connectives. Uh, box and diamond can apply to formulas. Uh, and this abstraction thing, if X is, capital X is a formula, little x is an object variable, and T is an intention function term, then this thing is a formula. Uh, think of it as uh, the predicate abstracted from capital X holds of T. Uh, means holds of what T designates. The definition of free variable occurrences, because we do have variables here, it's the usual one, together with, in this abstract here, uh, the free variable occurrences are whatever are free in phi, except for occurrences of x, but together with free variable occurrences in t. So this uh, lambda abstract acts like a, a binary. Uh, so here, p of a is not legal, where a is an intention constant. You need variables there, but you can think of it as an abbreviation for, for this. The predicate abstracted from P applies to P. <coughs> but what about something like this? Diamond, diamond, P of A. Uh, it could be any of these. Uh, the predicate abstracted from diamond, diamond, P of X, or the predicate abstracted from diamond, P of X, or the predicate abstracted from P of X. And these, are, these all behave differently. Uh, for for this one, uh, P of A, there's only one natural meaning you could have, and it's that. And you could say, well, let's abbreviate that by the, the, the thing up, up there. But these are really different. And I don't want to introduce diamond, diamond, P of A, because there's no natural one of these to choose it to mean. So this is one of the reasons I am not allowing intention terms to turn up in uh, <coughs> Uh, atomic formulas. Uh, yes, they don't mean the same thing, not at all. I didn't allow function nesting. Uh, well, you can accomplish it by taking P of F of G of A to, uh, as short for this. Now, this one is, looks a bit of a mess, but what you're saying here is this predicate forms of x. I'm sorry, I'm getting dots on the board here. I should have lowered my hands. Let just uh, push clear there. It, 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 I assume it'll go away in a minute or no, push clear. Yeah. You push clear. Push clear. Okay, is that clear? Yeah. All right. Um, so the the the, the uh, predicate p holds of and x gets as its value uh, this, which is f applied to y, which gets as its value this, which is g applied to z, which gets as its value a. So all of these are evaluated at the world you're at. And that top thing is a natural abbreviation for the, the bottom thing. But you have the same kind of problem you had before. Uh, these three all behave differently, uh, where f and a are not rigid. And so again, um, Diamond P of F of A is seriously ambiguous, and I just don't want it. So uh, it's one of these is a kind of broad scope, one of these is a kind of narrow scope, and one of these is really somewhere in between. So rather than having to pay attention to which one are we doing at the moment, we just won't have them. All right.
right, so the semantics here. Uh, I assume you're all familiar with Kripke semantics. Um, all right, so this is a model. This is going to be the set of possible worlds. This will be the accessibility relation in the usual way. Uh, and this will be an object domain. Now, you, you, have a, you have two possible ways you could go here. You could have one object domain, which is the same for all of the possible worlds. Or you could have a varying domain kind of semantics where each possible world has its own domain. Um, the thing is, if you have a single object domain uh, for that all the worlds share, this is sometimes called possibilist semantics, um, you can simulate the others by having uh, an existence predicate, which is supposed to be true at a world of the things that actually exist there, and then relativize things to that existence predicate. So by picking a single object domain, I'm not losing any generality, but I'm considerably simplifying the the semantics. Uh, and then finally, an interpretation function, which tells you how the, what the meaning of the various symbols is supposed to be. And that's what we need to concentrate on. So for each n-place relation symbol, p, the interpretation of p is a function from g to p of d n. Well, what, what is all of that saying? Uh, the, the interpretation of, a, of an n-place relation symbol should be a something that assigns to each world, and this is really some n-place relation. N-place relation thought of as a set of n-place over the domain. So the interpretation of a relation symbol is a relation, but it, can, it depends on what world you're in. Uh, oh, sorry. The, the equality symbol, I'm assuming, is uh, rigid and then simply maps to the equality relation everywhere. Uh, for any in place function symbol, this one is a little more complicated. The interpretation of a function symbol should be a mapping. For the moment, think of this as the set of worlds. So it should map the set of worlds and an end to an object. So, okay, it should. Just, it should assign to this function symbol at a world uh, an inary function. But uh, I want to allow these things to not designate some worlds, like the King of Sweden. So uh, it's not really defined on the entire of key. Each one of these is defined on some subset of key, and it can vary with the function symbol. So think of the S here as where the function symbol f designates something. Okay? Now, we need the notion of evaluation. We want to assign values to variables. So evaluation B just maps variables to members of the domain, assigns objects to variables. And this is what we still need to define, the notion of truth. So uh, in model N, at world W, formula phi is true with respect to valuation B. So M is the model, W is the world you're evaluating things at, it's formula phi you're evaluating, and B tells you how to understand the uh, free variables. Uh, okay, so this is what I just said. So, all right, so most of this is pretty straightforward. Uh, in fact, all of this is pretty straightforward. I've left out the one that isn't. Uh, for the atomic case, since we only allow variables here, this uh, is to be true at world W. If the n-tuple consisting of the values you assign to this is in the meaning you've assigned to the relation symbol at this world. Remember, that's some actual relation. So, the relation you've associated with this symbol at W should have these things in it for this to be true. Um, propositional connectives just behave truth functionally at each world, and I just gave implies as an example. X implies Y is true in the world if X isn't or Y is. Necessity is the usual thing. Box X is true at W, just in case X is true at W prime for all accessible W prime. And the valuation stays the same, and the possibility is 
same idea. Uh, this is the, uh, the serious one. Uh, look at the bottom one first. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm interested in when is this true? So at world W, under valuation V, this abstract should hold a function symbol A applied to these things. Now, this bottom one here, if A doesn't designate, we just take it to be false. Now, if A does designate, uh, well, we have to figure out what it is that's being designated. You're, if A does designate, then this actually uh, associates your interpretation of A actually associates a function with A at world value. Apply that function to the values associated with these variables. That gives you something. Change the valuation here to be one that associates with W uh, what, what that is. So this is the, the, the heart of it. So this should be true if this is true with respect to a different valuation. It's like the original one, except that it assigns to y the thing you're abstracting over. What this thing designates at that level, and to get that, you have to see what function was associated with a and apply it to the values of these things. Because everybody got this one. This is the key thing. Does anybody got this thing? Two thirds of you. Which two thirds? Okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry again. Uh, as a special case, uh, that was where A uh, was an n area function. Suppose A is a zero area function, in other words, a constant. This is what the whole thing reduces to. Um, if A designates at the world, this is true. If uh, this is true, using a valuation that's like the original one, except you've associated with the variable we're abstracting over whatever it is that A designates at that point. And if A doesn't designate, then it just falls. But it's easier to see it in this context whether you don't have the variables as input. It. It's the same idea. OK, so let's look at some examples. Someday the king of Sweden might be taller than now. This is what I formalized this way before. And I want to just show you uh, in a quirky model that it behaves the way you'd expect it to behave. I had some fun with this. Um, so let's see. The oldest known reference to a king of Sweden is in Tacitus around the year 100. So let's assume that in the year 50 there was no king of Sweden. Uh, there was a king, Magnus III Barnlock, who died in 1290. And as the result of excavating uh, a cemetery of male Swedish skeletons from about that time, they came up with an average height of 174.3 centimeters. So let's assume this king was average. All right. uh, the current king of Sweden, uh, Carl 16 Gustav, is 179 centimeters tall. And it's astounding how easy it is to find that fact on the internet. <laughs> I don't know why. All right, so let's set up a model here. There are three states. That's supposed to be the world in the year 50, the world in the year 1289, and the world in the year current year. Um, so there are three years represented. Uh, there are, the domain consists of those two kings, Magnus and Carlos now. Um, so it's, it's a constant domain that all the worlds have. Uh, the interpretation of M, the, 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 the monarch, the king of Sweden, it's not defined for the year 50. Uh, in this year, it's interpreted to be Magnus, and in this year, it's interpreted to be Carlos. So it's not here. So this is what I'm telling you here. Um, Let's see. Oh, I, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I told you what I was going to tell you. This is, so, uh, I'm giving you the interpretation of, uh, of T. It's supposed to be the taller than Freddie. 
and in fact, I'm interpreting it rigidly. The way you're using taller in the year 50 is the same as in 1289, is the same as here. This guy is taller than this guy. So it's interpreted rigidly. Uh, you know, I, I noticed, by the way, uh, this is a possibilist uh, semantics. You can talk about these things in the year 50 if you knew enough to talk about them, even though they don't exist in the year 50. Uh, all right, so this is the formula I showed you before. I want to verify that it's true in the year 1289. The valuation doesn't really matter because there aren't any true variables. Uh, okay, so the claim is this is true. Now, uh, why? Well, this has the form of an abstract. So what you should do is figure out what M designates under these circumstances, and that becomes the value of Y. All right, so this is true because this is true, the, the inner thing here, under evaluation that's like the original one except you see how you're interpreting monarch of in that year, and in fact, it matters. So this is true, if this is true, where d prime of y is max. Now, just to make things simpler, I'm going to uh, do something slightly illegal. i put this in in place of the y there, because it simplifies the notation. But understand it's a short uh, So I'm, I'm going to write it like this. So the original thing holds if this holds uh, where what was here is being assigned max. All right. That's true uh, because, let's see, uh, this is a diamond. So you have to move to an alternate, alternate world. For 1289, there is only one future world I show in this model. So it has to be because this, without the diamond, is true in uh, 2014. So we have to verify that that's true. Uh, and for this to be true, you have to see what n designates, and that becomes the value of x. So you have a different valuation in which you assign to x what n designates in 2014, and that's Carl Russell. And again, I'm going to do the same thing. I'll just put that in where the x is. So it comes down to the original thing holds that this holds. And uh, it does, because I set my interpretation of T to be this at all the worlds. So it's exactly what you'd expect. It's just showing you that the formal machinery does actually do what you want it to do. Uh, there are a few things uh, to, to try checking. Um, this formula does not hold in the year 50, because there's no king. It also doesn't hold in the year 2014 because there's no future. This model only had three, three years in it. So in that sense, it's not an adequate model. It, it illustrates something, but I really should have something there for each year. Um, all right. So here's another example. Alice might have been taller than she is. I originally formulated it this way. Uh, but this is not a legal formula. I have that A to A. So what we need to do is disambiguate the scope of the uh, height and Alice symbols. Uh, well, this is one way of doing it. It's, it's the way I showed you before. Uh, H of Z, the Z gets associated with the A, and so on. Um, so if you just unwrap this, it, it looks like the thing that I had before. But this is a legal formula. Uh, now, you notice these two, this H and this A, uh, th this term is associated with the X, this is associated with the Z, so these two are inside the diamond. These two, this is associated with the Y, this is associated with the W, they're outside the diamond. All right, so again, here's a, here's a very simple model. Uh, we're not talking years now, we're talking how things are and how they might have been. So W1 is how things are, uh, and they could have been like W2. <coughs> Alice, and the domain I've got here is there's Alice, and there are heights. Uh, and I'm just using whole numbers from 0 to 400. That's entirely arbitrary. Uh, 
I'm interpreting uh, the A symbol here, the non-rigid Alice, who is actually rigid, as uh, this Alice object in both worlds, so that she is rigid. It's the real world, the alternative world, this is Alice, and these are heights and centimeters. Uh, I'm interpreting the greater than relation to be the same in both worlds. Uh, it's all ordered pairs where the x is a greater number than y. The greater than symbol gets interpreted by greater than on the machinery we've got. Uh, the intention constant A designates everywhere. <coughs> it always designates Alice, so it's rigid. The function symbol H designates everywhere, but so it's supposed to designate a function. The function it designates at W1 assigns to Alice 165. The function H at W2 assigns to Alice 180. So the thing that maps Alice to her height is mapping it to 165 at W1 and to 180 at W2. All right. Well, that's non rigid So it's exactly what I was saying before. Uh, Alice uh, is a rigid designation. But the height is a non-rigid attribute. Now, I'll leave it to you to check that this uh, evaluates to true at one W1. Uh, we can take the next half minute or so. Um, this is a nice quote here. It's from Walden. You must be a great calculator indeed who succeeds. Simplify. Um, that that formula is messier than it needs to be. It was the first thing that, that came to mind, but it's messier than it needs to be. If A is rigid, why do you have to have it twice there? Should they have the same meaning in both cases? But here we have it once inside, once outside. We could simplify it to this and get rid of one of the variables. Um, a that's associated with Z, which means the current value of A goes here and it also goes here. But the current value of A is also the same as in the alternative world. So Y evaluates H before you move to a possible world, and X evaluates H after you move to a possible world, both at A, which is the same no matter which. So this should behave like the other one. And it's a nice exercise. Um, I had something like this down before. Uh, I said if, uh, if A was rigid, you'd have something like this. Actually, this is what's called local rigidity. Uh, the usual definition of, rig of rigid uh, is it's the same in all worlds where it designates something. But you can have worlds here and worlds here, and you can't get from these to these. There's no path of accessibilities that will take you from here to here. And so there's no modal formula you can say that's true here that says anything about these worlds. So this is local rigidity. Um, what it's saying is what A designates now, A will designate in any accessible world. So certainly rigidity implies this. <coughs> and, uh, and But this is weaker than full rigidity. But full rigidity is not quite what you want because it involves talking about completely inaccessible worlds. But anyway, so this. Uh, so this is a, a good exercise. Um, suppose capital A is this first formulation that I had. Capital B is the second formulation. And this is a valid formula. If A is locally rigid, then capital A and capital B are equivalent, not just in that one model I showed you, but under all circumstances. As valid means true in all models. Now, you have to assume, you can assume the modal logic is K, which is the weakest, weakest of the normal modal logics, which means it will hold in any normal, uh, modal, normal logic. You have to assume equality is interpreted as the equality relation in all possible worlds. Okay, what about happiness? Well, for Alice and height, uh, we had a non rigid map from persons to heights. I was assuming heights were numbers, and I had them zero to four. Uh, all right, that, 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 that got 
was going. Uh, but actually, all you need is that it's some linearly ordered entity. Any two heights can be, can be compared. Um, doesn't have to be numbers. Um, and if you can measure heights by putting somebody against the wall and drawing a line. And then you know what it means for somebody to be taller than somebody else. The line you get here is above the line you get here. And numbers don't actually come into it. It doesn't matter. You just need some kind of linear order. Um, in fact, usually when I say he's taller than she is, I don't have numbers in mind at all. I, I'm very bad at estimating heights. In fact, I, I do know that from my own height, I'm usually looking up at people, but I don't really estimate numbers. Uh, what about degree of happiness? So it's, it's a, what's, you, it should be some sort of partial ordering. Uh, a partial ordering, or well, let's see, if A is bigger than B and B is bigger than C, A should be bigger than C. A should never be bigger than itself. But you don't necessarily uh, have the ability to compare any two things. Where A and B, A may not be bigger than B and B may not be bigger than A. Which seems to be quite appropriate for happiness. Uh, if this is ha if this person is happier than they, and they are happier than them, this is ha guy is happier than him. But these two, their happiness may be quite incompatible. They're happy in different ways. Uh, so, uh, well, that, that, that's a nice model. Uh, now. What about proof procedures? I've shown you uh, the syntax, I've shown you the semantics, and I probably don't have any time to do proof procedures in, in any plausible in detail. But this predicate abstraction machinery has been axiomatized. Uh, this is a, a paper of mine from some years ago. FOIL stands for First Order Intentional Logic. And this is actually a broader system than you've seen here. Uh, it allows uh, relation symbols to hold not just of objects but of intentions. Uh, the pizza is here. Uh, of intentions. Uh, it has quantifiers in it and quantifiers ranging over objects and quantifiers ranging over intentions. Everything you saw here can be formalized in it but a lot more as well. Uh, there, there are what are called prefixed tableaus, uh, which you can find in the book I did with my colleague uh, Richard Mendelson. Uh, if you know semantic tableaus at all, prefixed tableaus are tableaus with some extra machinery that keeps track of possible worlds and does so syntactically. Uh, I said this was from a paper that hasn't been published yet, and this whole second half of the paper that I haven't discussed uh, gives what's called a nested sequence formulation. Are, are, are any of you familiar with nested sequence? Okay, well, it's, it's spring and the birds will be nesting their sequence very soon. <laughs> uh, now, look, the, the idea is this. Uh, are you familiar with sequence calculus? Okay, so typically in a sequence calculus, uh, you, uh, you have a bunch of formulas. Here are all a bunch of formulas. Uh, let me give you a loose idea first. Uh, in a nested sequence calculi, calculus, formulas and other sequence can appear in these places. So sequence can be nested within sequence. Now, as I just said, it, it can be simplified some. This is what's sometimes called a two-sided sequence. Well, an A on this side behaves like a not A on this side. B on this side behaves like a not B on this side. So I can replace this by this. Um, and just give my rules as if only things on the right occurred. In which case I don't really need the arrow. And this is what's called a one-sided sequence. Well, a one-sided sequence is just a set of formulas, but if you remember the way things are on the rights of arrows, they're interpreted like orders. So it's this or this or this or this. So if you, if you understand that, you can easily give rules for one-sided calculi. Uh, 
Uh, well, so a sequent, one-sided, is just a set of formulas with the commas and, uh, understood disjunctive. Uh, a nested sequent, uh, one-sided sequent, is a set of formulas and nested sequence. So this is a set. Would be an essence. For an ordinary sequent, uh, uh, if you have this, it should be taken as an axiom. Remember, this is a big disjunction, and everything is on the right of the arrow, and you've got something in its negation. For a nested sequence, it's an axiom if A and not A occur at any level. So that would count as an axiom. Uh, the rules you know for ordinary sequence in nested sequence apply at any given uh, depth of nesting. But how do you interpret this, what, what nesting means? Think of this as saying you have this or this or this or this or necessarily this or this or necessarily this. Every time you move down the level, it's necessary. Once you understand that, then it's not too hard to come up with uh, modal rules for nested sequence. Uh, you may be familiar with the fact that uh, the sequence calculus and tableau systems are really the same thing. One is the other upside down. Well, nested sequence and prefixed tableau uh, systems are the same thing. One is the other upside down. So anyway, so there's a nested sequence formulation for this. And I need to give a credit here. Uh, this talk is based on a paper, and I don't mean the paper that I wrote that hasn't appeared yet. Uh, it grew out of hearing uh, a talk by Kai Weimeyer in 2010, he gave a talk at City University uh, called Subjunctivity and Cross-World Predication. It was exactly this kind of issue. How do you handle making a statement about somebody under present circumstances and somebody other, under other circumstances? And his way of handling it was to have predicates that didn't, where the places weren't just filled by what they were in a world, but across worlds. So it moved the whole burden of the thing to the machinery of the, the relation symbols. Uh, well, that got me thinking about things, and I thought this would be a nice way of doing it. And I kind of think, but I, I never have verified it, that what he did can be embedded in what I did, but not the other way around. But uh, where do you go? Oh, because I have this upside down, I'm going backwards. Uh, but anyway, that hasn't been verified. And that's really as far as it goes. So that's the end of the talk. Thank you. Function, intentional function. Mm -hmm. That's the only difference. That's the difference. 
but it's, it's a major difference. The, the, the thing is, the, the variables have as their values just objects in the domain. The, uh, uh, think of a, a non-rigid constant symbol as a parameterized thing like that. What it has as its value is parameterized by the world you're in. And the machinery of modal logic, unless you do hybrid logic, has no uh, uh, mechanism for talking about the world you're in. Mm -hmm. Of what? The world you're in. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we handle it by having two different types of uh, symbols in the language, one of which is world dependent, one of which is. But we can do that by index, right? By fixing something to that world. Yes. So it's yes. not the same machinery. Well, it, it, it's it, different. It, it is the same machinery. Of course. seems like a perfectly reasonable observation. I wouldn't really say that wide scope means rigid. They, 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 they have different, different concepts, but the different, the different, different concepts. But as a consequence, you can do this. But th this is exactly it. The, the, the A here turns into a wide scope. Critically, what's changed, if I recall well, is that we can have rigidity without having the machinery of quantification. And well, there is no, no distinction in terms of wide right versus narrow, but here you have a distinction between rigidity and non-rigidity. Yes, yes. But I mean, you haven't seen any quantification here, but it's, uh, the, the, the business of scope is what's really operating. So lambda does not work as a, as a quantifier. It does not work as a quantifier. By the way, something I should say, um, I never said what the underlying modal logic was. The one case I did, it, I suppose, K. Um, if you formulate this for K or for T or for D, this is deciding. A deciding uh, system. If you formulate it for S4, it's not decidable. If you formulate it for S5, it's not decidable, even if you don't have equality. So, What's going on here is a little subtle. Uh, you get some of the effect of first order logic, but with, without the actual quantifiers being there. But if the lo modal logic is simple enough, it's more like propositional. That doesn't 
actually answer your question. But, uh, but I, I, I'd say uh, rigidity and wide scope are simply different notions, and it is a fact of the matter that 